Well, good morning. I'm Ruth Whaley, and I'm here at Risk Loans 2012. And I'm here talking with Professor John Hull. John is Professor of Derivatives and Risk Management at the University of Toronto, and also a very prominent researcher in the field of derivatives globally. Um, so John, you're, you're known for your work on LIBOR and OIS discounting in derivative valuations. And today you're going to take that a step further. You're going to talk about the FBA debate. Tell us about that and where that's leading you. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, I st uh, Ruth. I start. Alan White and I started in um, looking at the LIBOR versus OIS question, which is a big thing in derivatives markets, because traditionally derivatives practitioners have discounted future cash flows at LIBOR, and, right. and, and the LIBOR and swap rates have been their proxy for the risk-free rate, and mm -hmm. there's a, a big body of theory in derivatives markets which says that you project cash flows in a certain way and then you discount them at the risk-free rate. So right. you need a risk-free rate. Right. And traditionally, as I say, it's been LIBOR, uh, LIBOR rate and the swap rate that's been the risk-free rate. Um, but during the crisis, the um, spread between, say, LIBORs and treasuries was, was huge. And, right. and uh, people have tended to switch from the LIBOR rate to the OIS rate versus the overnight index swap rate. And so Alan and I have written about that, and uh, the market practice appears to be that um, if you've got a, a collateralized transaction, OIS discounting is the appropriate thing to do. If it's not collateralized, then you stick with LIBOR discounting. And our main comment on that was, no, we think that you should use OIS discounting for everything, mm -hmm. and then the counterparty credit risk is taken into account with CVA and DVA. Right, right. So that, you know, that was one area of research and right. we more or less finished that. And it kind of, it did, as you say, it, it kind of led into the, um, this research on this thing called FVA, which is the funding value adjustment. And uh, I'll be talking about that at the conference tomorrow, uh, in point of fact. I think the work that we've done on the funding value adjustment has probably been more controversial than any other research that that we've done. Um, I was actually invited to write an article for the 25th anniversary edition of Risk Magazine um, back in July mm -hmm. and I chose to write a, an article jointly with Alan White on the funding value adjustment and we got no end of emails from people. I, you know, probably two-thirds disagreeing with us and one-third saying, geez, we're glad somebody's finally said that. You've got it exactly right. Uh, so now, that was, John, this was also around the time of the LIBOR problems surfacing in the markets. No, no, this or was July this year. July this year. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, right, it, it, okay. yeah, it, um, yeah, I think, you know, you're thinking of the, the problems yep, associated with, with actually with measuring, measuring LIBOR yeah. and manipulation of LIBOR. But yeah, the, those have received much more publicity recently, although they've been around for a little right. while now. This whole business of, of how um, LIBOR, uh, our, our, our discussion of LIBOR versus OIS discounting led into FEA. FEA. We wrote this article for, for Risk Magazine, the 25th anniversary edition of Risk Magazine and received more comments on it than we'd received on pretty much anything else we've ever written. There was a rebuttal article in the next issue of Risk Magazine written by a couple of guys from Royal Bank of Scotland, which was disagreeing with us. And then we were asked to write a rebuttal to that, which we did. So we got two articles in Risk Magazine on this topic. And we've since written a more academic piece. So what, you know, what's the real debate here? I mean, <coughs> what practitioners seem to be doing to a lot now is, is to say, if you have an uncollateralized derivative position, then you've hedged it, and that derivative position together with the associated hedge has to be funded in some way, and it's on average funded at the bank's cost of debt. So therefore, this practice of discounting at the risk-free rate isn't right, we should discount at the cost of debt because that's what's being used to fund the transaction. And our point was, no, that's not right. Um, what you should do is to separate funding from the value of, an, of any investment decision that you're making, um, including a derivatives investment decision. So the discount rate you use should reflect the riskiness of 
the investment, not some sort of average historical funding cost, which doesn't apply to that particular investment. And so the risk-neutral valuation principle, which underlies all derivative valuation, says that uh, you should use the risk-free interest rate. So you want to use the best proxy for the risk-free interest rate when valuing derivatives. And so we disagreed with this, uh, and, and I'm going to be presenting this at the conference tomorrow. We disagreed with this um, idea that the FBA adjustment should be made. And actually, we've received more comments recently which have been agreeing with us. Uh, so I would say at this point in time, it's probably 50% of the uh, emails we've received on this subject have been pro <laughs> and and 50 percent have been anti so it's a really interesting issue and it, you know i think over the next couple of years it'll probably be resolved one way or another in terms of what is recommended industry practice right. on this right but as, as of today though most banks are not implementing this kind of approach yet no they are no they are, I, in they fact actually, they are implementing okay. fba okay. and uh, not all banks, right. but it, it is a fairly common practice to implement FEA, and it gets complicated. You know, I mean, it, as far as um, I, I mean, FEA is something that's primarily applicable to transactions that are not collateralized, because transactions that are collateralized typically you earn the federal funds rate on the collateral, the collateral that's posted, right. and so you right. say, well, those transactions are funded at the federal funds rate because right. either we're paying the federal funds rate to the other side, or the other right. side's paying the federal funds right. rate to us, and when you work that through, right. the um, the hedged position is being funded at the federal funds rate. So. Uh, uh, and and we we discount you know it, it, the other side of this research is that you discount the um, the uh, collateralized tr transactions at the OAS rate, which is linked into the federal funds rate. So all of you know all of that seems reasonable, but what? But then people say, well, what if what if we're not earning the OAS rate on our collateral? I mean, suppose we're earning the OIS rate plus 50 basis points, or then I would agree that you want to make a, an adjustment for, because that's, you know, it's a real cash flow that, you know, either, I, either, it, either the, um, the interest rate associated with the, the collateral is, is, greater than the Fed, is greater than the Fed funds rate or less than the Fed funds rate. But that's a quite separate issue from if the transaction is not collateralized, yep. what you should use as the discount rate. And right. again, I, I, you know, come, I come back to this idea that you should keep the funding of your business quite separate from the risk of the individual transactions. I mean, <laughs> there's a tendency to think if I, Otherwise, you do all sorts of strange things. For example, let's suppose on average you fund at, uh, shall we say, the OIS rate plus 200 basis points. So on average, you're funding 200 basis points above the OIS rate. And then you come across this uh, um, <clears throat> opportunity, which is very, very low risk. I mean, you never get zero risk opportunities, but it's very, very low risk. And so what do you do? Do you insist on this brand new opportunity to come across? Has that got to earn the OIS rate plus 200 basis points in order to recover your cost of funding? Right. Or could you right. say, well, this is really low risk. You know, we should be happy with, you know, OIS rate plus 25 basis points for this. Uh, and I would say the second is true. You should always look at the investment that right. you're thinking of going ahead with and associate the return you require with that investment, not to, not look at your sort of historical funding costs. Yeah, yeah think about it as an yeah. investment rather so, than a payment. And this stream. is something that, you know, we've been teaching yeah. corporate finance courses yeah. in, in finance for a long time. Um, so, it, you know, it's all tied up with uh, uh, what accountants want to do and what the Treasury, you know, what the, what the Treasury desk wants to do within the bank. Right. So there's a lot of so you know, there's a lot of issues for. within the bank and a lot of people who have got different um, different objectives as right. far as all this is concerned. Well, it's another wrinkle in the uh, credit derivatives arena, which uh, has many wrinkles year after year. Um, and so just tell us finally, what are your expectations around the future of the credit derivatives markets now? Uh, there's been so much changing. We've got regulations that are still in process of being implemented. Still some uncertainty about degree of collateralization, end users, etc., etc. What do you see now? You know, cre um, credit derivatives is a really interesting uh, market. I mean, it hardly existed in the 1990s, right. and then we had, you know, ISDA coming up with a really good definition of default in the late 1990s, and since then the, the market has just taken off. 
Um, but then when you've had the defaults, you've had debates about what is a default? <laughs> well, it, well, yeah, you know, there's, you, you, never, you, never, you never finally resolve those debates, yeah. I guess. But, what, well, you know, what do I, I mean, what happened during the crisis was that the very simple credit derivatives, the plain vanilla, single name, Corporate, CDS, right. credit default swaps, they continued to trade, albeit at very high spreads. Right. Um, so, the, that market is a fairly stable market. It, you know, there's a lot of transparency in that market. Everybody understands how the products work. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yes, you can say sometimes we get arguments about uh, whether whether Greece has defaulted as far as CDS is a concern or it hasn't defaulted as far as CDS is a concern and that sort of thing. But, but those are relatively rare. So that, the, I think the, pro you know, the problems have been with the really uh, exotic transactions which have been created by securitizing right. securitizing mortgages and other things. Now, it's not the first level of securitization that I've got a problem with. The first level of securitization is pretty transparent, where you take a pool of mortgages and you create tranches from that pool. It's when you re-securitize and you, you take, yeah, you, and you create what some people call an ABS CDO from right. the ABSs that were right. created at the first. That, that's where you get an incredibly, um, complex product and you know one of the things that happened during the crisis was people really realized you know in about August 2007 that they really didn't understand how this product worked um, and they weren't able to model it well they were relying on the the ratings of you know, of the of the credit rating agencies um, so I what I would say will happen is that uh, you know these the resecuritization will disappear you know things like you know, um, single name credit default swaps and right. and ABS is sort of first level of securitization. I think those are really valuable additions to to the market that you know where derivatives are serving their traditional purpose of transferring risk right. from uh, one entity into the in the economy the to another. Is what that you can look through to the underlying. Uh, we just had a panel here, very interesting on litigation risk. And uh, there's even a thought that at some point one could buy a credit derivative against litigation risk. But again, you'd have to really understand the underlying and have transparency. Well, there. yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting idea. I haven't thought about it, but, uh, you know, you, you can... Uh, you can buy insurance against rogue trader risk, right. for example. So if you can buy insurance against rogue trader risk, why can't you buy insurance against litigation risk? Presumably insurance companies can put the same sort of controls in place yep. to protect themselves. Yep. So it's a very interesting idea. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So credit derivatives still a future ahead. I think so, yes. Well, John, thank you very much. It's been fascinating. We look forward to your talk tomorrow. My pleasure, Ruth. Thank you. Okay, thank you.